Hey Rebel Riser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy. And thank you so much for joining me for it. So, through nearly four hours of cutscenes and conversations in Jedi Fallen Order, and I gather that gameplay itself is a lot longer than that, right? And I think there are other options and other little tidbits of information that pop up when you get to uh, multiple versions of conversations and whatnot. But for the most part, like what we've talked about over the past two weeks is everything that there is to know about Jedi Fallen Order, and we're going to do a top seven and takeaway situation to wrap things up here. For our first takeaway, we're going to talk about our main character, Cal Kestis, who was instructed to trust only in the Force by his master, Joro T'Pol, but through the course of Jedi Fallen Order, he learns to trust in himself and also to heal from the very significant trauma of the Clone Wars and of the Order 66 horrible situation that he found himself in. And yeah, those scenes were actually traumatic. Like that flashback was really powerful. So the reason why Cal was on Bracca is because that's where he was at the advent of Order 66 and he's been surviving there for the last last five years until we meet him in 14 BBY and he's discovered and ends up getting adopted <laughs> sort of forcibly sort of ah, yeah what other choice did he have by the crew of the mantis but it does turn out to be one of those we'll see situations because things were really bad and it looked like he was about to die and then he ended up with the mantis crew and suddenly not only was saved but found a purpose that he had been lacking for the last five years. For a second takeaway, we'll talk about Seer Junda, who was also traumatized by Order 66 in her own particular way, ended up touching the dark side of the Force when she saw what had happened to her former Padawan, and we'll get to... <laughs> that in a moment and has since cut herself off from the force which means that her stated desire to resurrect the Jedi Order like she can't do it because she's been compromised she needs somebody to help her out and make it happen that's where Cal Kestis came in but she ends up following her own path as she speaks about when she and Cal are talking in one of their interstellar voyages she too is able to complete her story arc and have a reckoning with her former Padawan and to express her deep sorrow and regret at the choices that she made and how it made things so terrible for her Padawan as a result. And then of course there's the grand irony that her whole purpose of rebuilding the Jedi Order, like her idea that this holocron was going to be able to help them do it, that they ultimately decided to destroy the holocron and as Cal said that their destiny should be determined by the Force and you know you could argue that <laughs> <laughs> that them getting access to the holocron was the will of the force and therefore maybe they should have continued on but yeah that vision that cal has about how you know, he became a master was training a bunch of younglings in the empire finding them and hunting them all down yeah that obviously was a big turning point in that whole situation now always in motion of course the future is but yeah people make the best decisions that they can make with the information that they have and with the the level of growth they have. So yeah, you just have to hope that that's going to be the right decision that they've made. But at least from a storytelling perspective, they put all the elements in there that were necessary for it. All right, so third takeaway, let's talk about Marin. So our night sister that we don't actually meet until pretty late in the festivities, as it turns out. Now, we don't get the same depth and character arc from Marin as we do with Cal and Seer, but then again, we don't spend nearly as much time with her as we do with Cal and Seer. But there is still something satisfying to see somebody who has been lost kind of in a similar fashion because the Night Sisters were massacred the same way that the Jedi were massacred, and for her to have a new found family with Cal and Seer and Grease, like, yeah, that is definitely a satisfying result to where her back story was when we first met her. For our fourth takeaway, let's talk about the Inquisitoria, specifically the second sister and the ninth sister. So the ninth sister, yeah, I, I know other stuff. And so I know that even though it certainly looked like the ninth sister was dead, the ninth sister is not dead. You can never <laughs> assume that they're dead unless they tell you they're dead. And I guess by the same token, it's hard to say that the second sister is dead also because you just see Vader go swing and she drops and that's it. But, you know, when it's Vader, it's a pretty... Well, I guess I would have said it's a pretty safe assumption except for the fact that he stabbed Reva, Reva? Reva, um, who became the third sister when she was a youngling and she still survived. 
So I guess the lesson is nobody's perfect, not even Darth Vader, but be that as it may. So we also got a very satisfying story arc for Trilla, AKA the second sister, finding out what her backstory had been in Order 66, the unfortunate decision that Seer made trying to be strategic but did not work out and how terribly it ended up going for Trilla as a result. And to the credit of the writing team for Jedi Fallen Order, the reconciliation between Seer and Trilla at the end of the story was really very powerful and well done and believable. You actually got the feeling from Trilla that maybe there was a chance that she could come back from the dark side of the force in you know similar fashion to how Luke was able to bring Darth Vader back from the dark side like the fact that Seer was able to connect so deeply and meaningfully with Trilla in the story was just very well done. For a fifth takeaway, I'll flag the fact that we got an idea of the broader conflict happening, particularly in the scenes on Kashyyyk, and in particular of that when Sagarera showed up. It was great to have him be a part of this, and also, you know, the partisans along with him, to learn that they were deeply involved with the Wookiees on Kashyyyk and trying to help them out. Although, as Seer points out, it's easy to believe that Saw had kind of a greater agenda. And I think to some of the stuff that Saw did in the Generoso backstory novel Rebel Rising and how he didn't care about, you know, civilian casualties or anything like that. So, you know, the fact that he was definitely careful about not, you know, harming any Wookiees in his attack on the refinery or anything like that suggests that, yeah, you know, he's not necessarily thinking about the Wookiees as civilians. He's definitely thinking about them them as strategic pieces in whatever his plan is to you know continue to fight the empire and so yeah making wookies mad by killing civilian wookies arbitrarily definitely not part of saw's plan for a sixth takeaway let's talk about the zepho so this is particularly fascinating that we have introduced to us another force sensitive civilization an advanced civilization that has since gone extinct or at least as far as we know has gone extinct what we you know heard from the Zepho sage in that in that one scene in Jedi Fallen Order is that they took the remnant of what was left as they became corrupted seemingly by the dark side of the force uh, off into the great unknown which may be the unknown regions to try to find peace once and for all so there may be Zephos still kicking around in the unknown regions if that's where they actually went or, you know, they may have died off at some point. We don't know for sure, but the fact that there was yet another force-wielding civilization, like, we should be paying attention to that, especially since they're saying that, you know, they you refer know, a long, from a long time ago, as it were. You know, and thinking about things like, you know, the ancient, uh, uh, you know, it's Jedi, like it's got a weird, you know, spelling and an apostrophe in the middle of it. Uh, and the fact that James Mangold is going to be doing a Dawn of the Jedi movie that takes place like 25,000 years before the events of A New Hope. Like, these are things that we should probably be filing in the back of our head because it may come up in future storytelling. And for a seventh and final takeaway, I'll just wrap up my thoughts on the overall story, which is that I do like the idea that, you know, there's a Jedi holocron that's stored someplace and it's a key to restoring the Jedi Order. It's interesting that Master Cordova decided, oh, you know, I've been into these Zepho folks and so I'm going to use this Zepho vault to hide it and I've got to qualify somebody basically to go on a quest to be able to you make sure that they're the right person to do this which seems like a very video gamey kind of story and you know the way the story unfolds in its very road trip kind of fashion seems more like it's made to serve a video game kind of thing than it is a normal story kind of thing you know so it does what it's supposed to do basically but the real story of Jedi Fallen Order seems to me to be BD1 story it's the story of a little droid who was so beloved by his master by Master Cordova and who loved his master in return like the relationship between the two of them was very sweet and very potent and very tangible and the fact that master cordova knew his time was ending and was going to have to leave his loyal and faithful droid and said you know i know you're going to be able to find somebody who you can trust again the way that you trust me and he finally found someone, Sir Jinda finally brought someone to BD-1 that BD-1 could develop that trust with and be able to, you know, open himself to again. So it is kind of a, you know, a you know, boy and his dog, you know, or, you know... <laughs> 
and what the equivalent would be, you know, um, a droid and his human love story. So it's a family lost and family found situation at the heart of Jedi Fallen Order. So yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. I'm sorry that it took me so long to check it out, but I'm grateful that I did and I hope you've enjoyed us talking about it over the last couple of weeks. And if you have enjoyed us talking about it over the last couple of weeks and you are enjoying the podcast in general, if you haven't done this yet or in the last little while, I hope you will consider sharing the podcast with other friends you know who like Star Wars and possibly even subscribing or following, depending on how... <laughs> the app you're using wants you to do it and even potentially giving a rating or review if you feel happy to do that as well. And so that's going to do it for this episode of the podcast. It just remains for me to say thank you so much for joining me for it as always. And may the force be with you wherever in the world you may be. By seven is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and/or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited. Other respective trademark and copyright holders may the force be with them. All original content is copyrighted by Star Wars Seven by Seven. We hope you love it.